first thing we have to do, we need to, uh, we have two minutes that we have to do acceptance of minutes for. So first up is November 17th. I think that one has some revisions maybe that we but anybody recall for November 17th minutes? Any changes or issues? I can't remember which one, and this is super minor, <laughs> but um, one of the two is I was looking through them today had Kate listed as Patrick City Council and then just Josh Gatton without the same banner. <laughs> <laughs> and it just seems that, you know, if we're animating that, it should be the same on both. I, and I don't remember if that was November or something. Yeah, we can take a look. <laughs> take a look at all. Mm -hmm. Likely. Yeah. Likely. Yeah. Likely. Yeah. Likely. Yeah. Likely. Yeah. Likely. November because I missed it. Yeah. Okay. okay. That makes sense. So mm -hmm. November. Will that change? Does anyone else have any? I should also highlight you should probably have a last initial. When you have Kate in the minutes, whenever there's Kate in the minutes, because it can be confusing. Uh, which Kate? Um, is there two Kate? Great idea. <laughs> I was in attendance at the December meeting, but it does not say I am listed as a part of the attendees. We have to do November or this year first. Anybody want to bring up November with motion to accept November? Accept. Always change. Second. Second. Perfect. And then December with adding July. Anybody bring that forward? Motion. Motion is set. Or a second. There we go. Still got to go all in favor. Oh, sorry. It's okay. All in favor of accepting the November 17th minutes. Uh, I, uh, and all in favor of accepting the December 15th minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Right that time. Um, we are going to switch it up. So we, Chad is going to do his presentation first. Um, and then move on to the next thing. So be there. Have the time needs. I'll set a timer for said 20 minutes. <laughs> all right. So this kind of came together last minute, but I like to, I think we're all a pretty friendly group. And so just very quickly, can I get a show of thumbs? Uh, if you if circular economy is something that you're a master at, you know everything about it. If you're kind of ah, uh, or if you're like, I've never heard of this, can I get a show of thumbs? Okay. <laughs> Okay. And what about X as a service? Is that something that sounds really familiar? Is that down? <laughs> okay, cool. Okay, great. So I think this is lined up perfectly for that. So let's jump over to the next slide. So unfortunately, we live in a, uh, the kind of the societal norms is going the direction of more things are ending up in landfills. And a lot of our local service businesses are closing. You saw the, yeah, the graphic will come back up. Uh, and unfortunately, we're losing our planet and a lot of our community aspects in the process. So my hunch is everyone agrees with, with this, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but we don't have the resources to continue on this path. So let's talk about what you can do about it. So on this slide, yeah, we can go back to this. Oh, let's, let's pause here for a sec. Okay. So... Does anyone have a definition for linear versus circular economy? Does anyone want to throw out a definition out there? Yeah? Linear resources have one use, but circular means it can be injected back into the economy over and over again. Yes, that's exactly the path. So our traditional process or linear manufacturing, back up, yeah, uh, we take raw resources, we make our widget, and then they end up in a landfill. It goes in a linear process. Now, if you look at the environment, there's no such thing as a landfill. One thing dies, it becomes a food source for something else. So nature has been evolving for billions of years. Humans have been designing for a few thousand years. We created the landfill problem. Nature has evolved way past that. So this is living systems. One thing grows, another thing dies. It becomes a food source. It ends up in a cycle. So 
we need to shift towards a circular economy to dispose of disposability. So you can think of like incorporating the three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle, but overall on a system level, we need to rethink the operating system. And it creates a lot of, it needs a lot of creativity to actually do that. Let's jump to the next one. All right, so I know some of these graphics are gonna be a little bit tough to see, but this is from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. It's a really, really famous diagram. On the left side, you have biological cycle. And on the right side, you have a technology cycle. So the left side, it's really around materials that can be biodegradable and safely returned to the earth. And it really looks at products that are consumed such as food, but the core of it is really regeneration. How can we regenerate the planet? We're gonna focus on the right-hand side today. So this is relevant to products that are used rather than consumed. So instead of having the linear process, keeping it in a loop. So on the tech side, there's actually, you can say four R's. There's reuse, repair, remanufacture, and recycle. Now the inner loops, if you look on the bottom right and you bring it in on the inner loop is really where the most value can be captured. We spend a lot of time talking about the furthest out on the recycle because we can see a lot of that on like a plastic at the end of life. But you really got to, the further you move towards the center is where you have actually more impact. And you have to go up the val you have to go up the design stream in order to share that. So think about a smartphone, for example. A smartphone is worth a lot more as a sum of its parts. There's already been time, material, energy, and engineering put into that, as opposed to like you go one further out and you could reuse it, you go further out, maybe you re re refurbish it, and then you go all the way to the end, and you maybe try and recycle it. But if you can have the phone come back and go back out somewhere else, that is the ideal area. So with that, we're prioritizing the inner loop. So sharing, maintaining, and reusing, and it also offers better cost savings. So when you're pitching these concepts or trying to adopt them in a business, you get better cost savings by doing this as opposed to further out on these loops. Jumping to the next slide. All right. Any guesses of what company this is? I'll give you a hint. There's at least one person here wearing it. Oh, yeah. Yes, exactly. Has anyone heard of the Warnware division? Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, so, so anyways, let's first talk about why is this important? I, I love Patagonia as a, as a company of like, what should you be doing when you're in your companies? What Patagonia does? Uh, so why is it important? The clothing industry is one of the most polluting industries. And then, so just some stuff from Ellen MacArthur Foundation, trying to bring it back to EMF as much as possible. Conventional non-organic cotton production is a vast consumer of water and pesticides, polyester and nylon, and man-made materials, consuming energy resources. But they estimated over $500 billion in value is lost every year because clothing is barely worn uh, or, it's, or it's not recycled. It's just sitting in a closet or... People just give it to Goodwill, hoping that it ends up in a second home. Let's jump down another slide. So what I really love about this, this Warnware, this Warnware division is that, so their tagline, and we can, this slides don't actually matter for this one, but uh, the tagline is that they design for fun and built to last. So they say they make durable gear that can carry through epic moments. And then when you've gotten the most out of it, We'll buy back your gear so someone else can use it. And you get paid in Patagonia credit. So as a business model, I absolutely love this because they sell it once, then they, they have a way that it comes back to them, it gets refurbished, and then they give credit out to their customers so their customers purchase another Patagonia product. I think that's, that's brilliant for keeping it in circulation. And because they design it to last forever, it's, it's a perfect product to do that. So. I, that's, a, I think, a perfect example of the circular economy. Jumping on the next slide, we'll take a look at a big tech company. So Dell's moonshot goal is uh, by 2030, they say, with our technology and scale, we will advance health, education, economic opportunity initiatives, develop enduring results for 1 billion people by 2030. It's a bit fluffy. It's very much like a normal corporate, uh, corporate jargon, but... It's all connected back to reuse and recycle. So let's go to, so let's go down to the next one. So here's an example of how they're actually going about that with the circular economy. So they're looking at the materials, what, what materials can be re 
recycled and renewed. Uh, they're looking at design and manufacturing. They're looking at the overall usage, looking at the end of life. So they're thinking about this whole thing from not in a linear way, but they're thinking from cradle to grave, they're switching their mindset to cradle to cradle, looking at every single step of the way throughout the, uh, looking at the, every step of the way of their product. And, and I think that's something that we can think more about it. Like, are we choosing the right materials to go in? How are we extending the life of this? And as people switch over to more of a mindset of circular economy or companies switch over to more of a circular economy, then in turn, they want to keep things lasting longer and easier for it to disassemble and recover the raw materials. So let's jump on to the next slide. So here's their way of fixing the landfill problem. They're allowing their parts to be repaired by customers or repair facilities. So it's giving jobs back to local uh, computer shops, uh, which unfortunately are moving away from that as a whole. Uh, it's also, you could go on and, and look this up. I don't know if anyone's tried to replace a screen on their iPhone. It's a nightmare. It's an absolute nightmare to do. But they're trying to move in the, yeah, they're trying to move to, exactly. They're trying to move in the direction of making it easier for people. So it's, there's another concept in there called modular design. So let's say that they can keep, they, they say, okay, our next iteration, we just want to change the keyboard. They have a modular design where you can just swap something out. Let's say you want to upgrade something, you want more CPU or RAM. You can just swap that one component, upgrade it. Unfortunately, we're kind of moving, uh, most people are moving away from that direction, but they're trying to do this. So they're, they're giving back jobs, they're sharing, they're maintaining, and they're reusing. Let's jump on to the next one. So you can see that all of their products are able to actually, so once you fully disassemble it, you can see each of these individual components. And they can, if one thing breaks, instead of throwing away the whole machine, you can just replace the RAM or you can just replace the keyboard. You can swap out one thing. So it really, and you can send it back to the manufacturer. So that's how they're actually uh, making it more circular. Next one. All right, so shifting gears a little bit now, we're going into X as a service. Anyone want to throw a definition out there what they think X as a service <laughs> might be? Ooh. And it's one X. <laughs> Rather than owning a thing, you own the use of that thing. Bingo. That's it. So it's a servitization of any product. So instead of a product, you sign up for a service. So you're probably familiar with software as a service. So it, it, in the software industry, it's like perpetual licenses are now switched over to uh, as a service. So think of different ways that you can do this. Now, why is this good for sustainability? because you're switching the ownership back to the manufacturer. They're now responsible for what happens with this at the end of life, which causes the manufacturer to want to make it so it lasts longer, so that it can be disassembled, to think about what am I going to do with this thing? So instead of a, a washing machine, for instance, seeing the blue moving up there, washing machine as a service, let's think about your washing machine, guys. What do you do? Maybe you have someone try to repair it, doesn't always doesn't always work. Okay, it can't be repaired. Costs more to repair. It. What do you do with it? You have to pay somewhere to dispose it. Now, picture if Bosch owns their washing machine, mm -hmm. and when it's not working anymore, they have to come and take it back. And then you sign up for. Uh, it's also great if you're moving around. If you're more nomadic, which I think uh, younger generations are becoming more nomadic. You just cancel your washing machine service and say, <laughs> take it back. Like I, I don't want it as opposed to trying to put in a truck, as opposed to trying to get rid of it. So we're just gonna focus on X as a service. Let's jump down to the next slide. All right, this one's gonna be really, really tough to see. Uh, I, was in, I was envisioning <laughs> like a movie theater screen, but uh, what, we, what, it, what it is, is it's showing all of the different manufacturing segment or sectors and companies. And I even have to look at my screen closely. It's, electrical equipment, textiles and wearing apparel, machinery and equipment. So there's all these different subsets of manufacturing, anywhere from electrical equipment to textiles. And then there, the subcategories, all the, the outer, those other rings are product oriented, use oriented, results oriented and sharing platforms. So we'll go through some specific examples of that. So this, so, okay, yeah, let's jump on the next one. All right, so <laughs> all right, so there are four main archetypes 
that help to guide on the business model side. So on the left, the provider transfers ownership. On the right, provider keeps the ownership. So uh, product oriented. Uh, if you look on the left, the blue box, there's some examples. Product oriented, there's take back programs. Warnware, perfect example from Patagonia. Uh, then if you go over to the right, the top right, you have use oriented. There's one company called Hilti. It's a great example. You just sign up for access to the machine or to the tools that you need. It's, and a fun fact is that the average power drill in a household is used about 15 minutes over its entire lifespan. People just run and they just sit there. So instead, if you have access to these tools whenever you want, that's great. Also a plug for the ports of maker space, which also is a really cool place if you need to be able to do some work. Uh, then there's results oriented. Xerox did this about 20 years ago, but you pay per page. So you, or you, you pay for how much you actually print versus the actual machine. And then there's sharing platforms such as, this is a pretty cool company, Fat Llama. Fat Llama, you can rent anything from your community. You can rent bikes, you could rent snow, uh, snowboards, you could rent, uh, rent cameras, DJ sets, whatever, whatever you want access to. So instead of going on Amazon and buying your own DJ set, if you want a DJ for a party, you can just go on to Fat Llama and borrow it and then give it back after. <laughs> Let's jump on to the next one. All right, so an important aspect of this is that you can't just redesign the business model. You actually have to redesign some of the products. So going from cradle to grave, the linear side, over to cradle to cradle. So in every single phase of the process of product design, you can think about it. So for instance, one, design and develop product for lifetime and quality. The most impact you can make as a manufacturer is in the design phase, really thinking about how is it, how are you going to, what materials are you going to pull in? How is it going to be disassembled? Where are you getting those materials from? And, and then so... Uh, with that, thinking back to the, yeah, this is basically, this is another way of showing you the right side of the uh, Ellen MacArthur Foundation butterfly, but just what you can do at each of these steps in order to improve the product. All right, jumping down one more. All right, so we're looking at different value chains of hardware as a service. So there are a couple examples, a couple more examples. There's materials as a service. So BASF, much better version than uh, Monsanto, I would say. I uh, try to stay away from Monsanto, but BASF is a great example because they have uh, paying for coatings as a service. So instead of just buying the chemical, pay for a coating as a service. There's components as a service. So there's some laser, uh, laser cutting companies where you just, instead of buying a laser cutting machine, you're just all offering, I think it might be Trump. They're just offering it per component. You pay for that and they keep the machine in house so it's not shipped and there's cargo and you're trying to maintain it. Uh, there's also uh, products as a service. Get around is a great example for car sharing. And then there's equipment as a service. So even Phillips is moving in the direction of offering x-rays as a service. All right, let's jump down to the next one. So here are some global examples of X as a service. And this is now where you get to do some guessing. Which one of these do you think is mobility as a service? Anyone? Dance. Dance. Yep, top right. Okay, propulsion as a service. You might have to have really good eyes to get this. <laughs> Which one? One. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. So that's their, they call it now corporate care. It used to be called propulsion as a service, but that's from Rolls Royce. So dance is out in Berlin. Uh, corporate Rolls Royce is out in the UK. And what they do is that you own the uh, jet companies are now just paying for per propulsion that they get for their planes. So instead of buying the actual motor or the, the actual turbine, you pay for the propulsion. And that includes all the spare parts, 24 seven operating service. It includes any type of uh, preventative care, all of that. Um, and then they can monitor the engine so closely that they can do that. What about IT as a service? Follow up because I'm thinking it's not the dream logo. I can't actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes, process of elimination at a 50% chance. So Grover, you can actually just uh, get electronics and you just subscribe to that 
How long do you need a computer? How long do you need a set of headphones? Uh, so that you can send it back to them after. We all know that this is probably one of your fastest appreciated assets you can purchase, um, but you can sign up for a subscription for that instead. And then the last one is, well, by process of elimination, white goods as a service or clothing. I think clothing is a better one. Um, but you get with Rent the Runway, you can have access to all sorts of top of the line fashion and swap it out. And then the last but not least slide uh, on the next one. So the last but not least one, here's an example of a startup that's coming to Portsmouth that's uh, circular economy and mobility as a service. So you end up choosing the duration and the vehicle you want, and you can either rent it for daily, you can subscribe to it for monthly, or you can purchase it if you want it indefinitely. And then everything's included. So it's all, it's all electric. And then you can uh, get the maintenance, insurance, registrations, all the deliveries, all that stuff's included. So you remove all the frustration of ownership where something you, you're like, what am I going to do this when I'm done? Does it sit in your basement? No, you just cancel your subscription. It goes back. What if there's a part that's broken? Instead of you, like it's sitting there, you just go on to a website and say, come fix it. And that's the direction of X as a service that everything's going. And that's with one minute to spare. We're good. <laughs> What's the name of that company? Is that it? C-E backslash? It, no, it's startup? Rad Moto. It's a it's a startup that I'm working on. Okay. But I didn't want it. It's not a pitch for it. But, <laughs> and rod means bicycle and mo motor rod means motorcycle in German. So anyways, questions. Everyone's still awake. That's good. I don't see the close <laughs> guys. You said it was what? Rad moto? Rad moto. Like motor rod? Yeah, I own a BMW motorcycle mm -hmm. and that's motor rad. So you just switch the name rad. So rock. So <laughs> I was living in Germany where I'm yeah. doing the thesis and yeah. motor, motorrad is motorcycle. Yeah. And then rod is German for bicycle. And so rad, and then in beach towns, you hear like rad, that's, that thing's cool. Yeah. So that's a rad moto. Very cool. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks. And which, what theme do you own? Uh, 800 uh, F800 GS. Those are great. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's an unbelievable bike. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it lasts forever. Oh yeah, it, it has. <laughs> That's it. One question I have about this, and I uh, love the concept, or I should say one concern I have about this is um, the equity. Um, as far as like, you know, if you're, you know, making good money and you can afford a monthly payment on something all the time, that's a great way to go. If you're barely getting by, sometimes you can, you know, buy some used thing on Craigslist or whatever, yeah. and that'll get you through and you'll find some way to make it last because that's what you have to do. So everything goes to something in the service. I can see a whole segment of our population being left out. Or another thing that ends up happening is you have to buy something. You have to buy the cheapest, most disposable option. Of it. Where does that leave you? Whatever that's that product's useful life is up. So, so yes and yes. So on the B two B side, what ends up happening is that it goes it goes into your. Uh, it goes from your depreciating assets over to your uh, expense, just your normal expenses, your recurring expenses. So you can write it off easier than as opposed to capital equipment. The other thing is that let's, uh, I think the reason that Rad Moto I'm focused on now is because there's a big barrier to get into electric vehicles right now, the price point. And also people are like, ah, what's gonna happen? Is it gonna, like, how's it gonna depreciate? What's, uh, what's gonna happen at the end of life? It can remove those barriers, so it can give. You can look at it two sides. It gives access to things that people normally wouldn't get, and it typically leads people in direction to be able to get a higher quality product. When I say high, higher build quality is going to last longer because if you're going out and you're like, well, my budget's let's say two hundred dollars or two thousand dollars for a e bicycle, well, that's not going to last nearly as long as something that's maybe like six thousand dollars for. Uh, an e-bicycle, so it's built to last longer. So it kind of pushes people away from purchasing disposable things because instead of having to shell out the four thousand or six thousand dollars for a brand new e-bike, you can shell out let's say two hundred dollars, and so it gives more access to people. There's two ways. So there's two ways to look at it. So the, typically, if the manufacturer owns it, they're going to be motivated to make it last longer. Uh, BMW 
has a company called Share Now. And so they're looking at the future of mobility and you just pay for access to it, um, to their cars. So instead of them purposely uh, like forced out adolescents that uh, like it, it, it deteriorates over time, they want to stay as good as long as possible. So I think on the, on the economic side, I think there's, there's definitely two ways to look at it. It can give more people access to things that they would normally have to buy and it costs some money up front that they might not utilize much. So. Another way of looking at it is that uh, equity may not be something that the private sector does well. It can, can pursue the market, it can be efficient, it can use technology, but equity may be where the public sector comes in and um, complements what the sort of thing that Jess is, is describing. So then you have a, a, a transportation network company like uh, Uber or Lyft, perhaps expanding the bus system in serving areas that are low profit with um, uh, subsidies from um, the state or the feds or the city. There are great ex public um, examples of this, but in recycling uh, things like wedding dresses. <laughs> uh, there are whole websites devoted to uh, people who've worn a wedding dress once and they want it to go to somebody else who wear it. And then it gets passed on again and again and again. And um, it's not just wedding dresses, it's all kinds of expensive pieces of clothing um, because people can't afford them. And so, and, and you're never gonna wear it again. <laughs> At least you hope you're not. <laughs> you know, a great example that I, I, I thank you for the presentation. I think about my son lives up in Montreal and what's really big in Montreal is bike sharing. And so you, you got an app, there's two different big companies, there are bikes everywhere. And he could go out and buy a bike and then have to maintain that every, you know, every year. And the tire goes flat and he has to deal with that. This is, this is great. And percentage of time, if he bought a bike, how much time would the bike just end up sitting in his apartment and not being used? In the winter too, Montreal. In the winter. And, and so, you know, that, that this whole, the model of, you know, how can we make products that um, are more efficient, right? So if you have bike sharing, we're manufacturing less bikes which means less natural resources, less energy, less, let's stop buying things, like you said, individually, that, you know, if you're not gonna use it all the time, you know, there's, there's a great model right there. Exactly, getting the utilization rate up, especially for something that is an accessory, like a, a motorcycle, like motorcycles spend a lot of time sitting in a garage, and then yeah. you replace the battery, you do the oil change, all that, maybe you ride it once, Instead, if you move over to having access to it for a week, you probably, your utilization, the utilization rate of that asset will be much higher. Mm -hmm. And then the motivation of the manufacturer is to make a higher end product. And so it gets the utilization rate up, the quality of it up, and then there's less just sitting. You're making me feel guilty as my motorcycle is sitting at home in my shed on a trickle charger. <laughs> <laughs> and then you know, yeah. I think Effie has her hand up. Oh, yeah, hi, thanks. It was a great presentation. And I'm sorry to say, I didn't get the speaker's name and we don't see the speaker. We see the whole room. So over here. if someone could. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Maybe that it's, opening it's slide Chaz, again, I don't know. Yes, it's Chaz Sullivan. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hmm. We have another great example in Portsmouth of this um, for another luxury item, um, Freedom Boat Club, mm -hmm. where you buy a membership and share boats. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. And the utilization rate is super low. That's a really good example, local right here in town. Yeah. Yeah. The biggest thing, and I imagine the biggest hurdle, is a consumer trust issue and the logistics side of it, right? There's that inherent concern of, but what if I need a bike and I show up and there are no bikes? I have to go to a meeting, or, right? And over time, I think most business cases proved themselves, right? When Uber first came out, people were like, 
you know, I remember my dad being like, you're getting in a car with some random stranger. <laughs> I'm like, absolutely not. You know, and now it's the first person to call an Uber. And so there's like a very, there's an adoption cycle there. Um, exactly. And then scale it to right now you can get Uber X and you, you want a slightly upgraded version. But I do you think that that hurdle is sometimes hard it's it's a hard switch for people who are used to like owning their own car and then having to go through the growing pains as well um and i think on the logistics side too i think unfortunately sometimes it bring up i think like the southwest debacle like their planes running around right that was a logistical challenge of how they structured things mm -hmm. and because of that um you know modeling issue on one end you have there's nothing a consumer can do right but it, so it, it's just an interesting thing i i feel like i love services and ideas but that's always the first questions right the first hurdles there's two there's two different models that you're seeing as well looks like if we're looking at transportation you're mentioning uber in big cities it makes sense for Uber to be there because they're more condensed. You see a lot more the town, like the bike sharing programs and like lime screws and stuff because they get driven from one point to the next and then they stay in. But when you have smaller cities that are more spread out, they get scattered. Uh, at least with Rad, most of the ideas is that you you subscribe to it. It's your your bike. You do whatever you want with it. You want to go down to Florida and be there for two months with it. That's your choice. It won't be serviced in Florida. You got to bring it back but it's yours to use it anywhere you want. But instead of paying the 4,000 for an e-bike up front, you instead pay 200, 400, whatever the amount is. It's almost a middle ground. It's yours. Ownership. Yeah. Sure. Exactly. Let's say for your, uh, let's say for your kids going to college and you're like, I want them to have, I want them to have a bike, um, but I know that they're not going to maintain it. So why don't I get them this? And I know they're going to be there for one year and I don't want to deal with driving it around or this is uh, dealing with the service. It's just, it's all covered. Mm -hmm. So in a so. sense, it's more like a leasing almost. Yeah. It's like a lease. Yeah. So that's what you're starting. So there's so many different acts as a service. There's like, uh, so like the Patagonia is like you, you buy it and you, you buy it back, but then there's other companies like Trump, for instance, they put in uh, their laser cutting machine into your facility, you only pay per out like per part that comes off of it, but it's at your facility, and then they're responsible for servicing it. So you just use the machine. Oh, that's and, the, the yeah, so that's a good yeah, good photocopies of the high school. Yeah, they are not ours. Exactly, they disappeared one day, and then the next day there were new ones. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So Xerox is doing that. Yeah. So you're seeing a lot of different angles on the same model. So it's either it's shared like Uber. Or it's you have it in your area, you use it whenever you want, you pay per use. So there's a lot of different types of models in the X as a service. Um, I was going to add, I've long thought that one of the solutions to parking and housing together um, is when you build a new complex, rather than putting in enough parking for everyone, um, you have you know a rental option with your rental comes two hours of vehicle use per week and you have zip cars or whatever on site and a schedule and everybody has to sign up for their time frame that they're going to use the vehicles um and you know that just is part of your rent you, you do that and you don't have to factor in the cost of a parking space into the, the rent of the, mm -hmm. the house yeah. the condo yeah. and the utilization rate of the cars go up as opposed to just taking up space right. Is there any different areas on this too that uh, some of these solar manufacturers, installers, and manufacturers are going to do the same enforcement for the go? It's a big capital step to put a solar array on a building. Mm -hmm. uh, so, a number of the providers are essentially installing solar power as a service. Mm -hmm. You know, if you pay for the gear up front, you're essentially, essentially leasing it yeah. or paying for a service. Now, it's not going anywhere. You're always right. going to be the, the, the you, you user of that. Um, capability, but over time, it might become yours at a depreciated mm -hmm. discounted kind of rate. But it sort of eliminates um, a lot of the upfront capital 
hurdles, mm -hmm. which for big capital expenses like solar arrays are generally deal killers. Well, so, it actually you have a really good point because like, the other reason that doing those, those contracts like that with solar is that the private energy company that's providing you the energy with that solar panel gets to take a tax rate off yes. on the panels. Right. Can, you, can you or a business that rents a service like that do that tax rate off on a I assume EV fleet, like an EV fleet. I wonder. Yeah. I don't know yet. I would, I would, if there, yeah. if there is money, yeah. <laughs> I would love to know. Great point. Because some lower rate vehicles, exactly. Yeah, because yeah. yeah. the lower gear, right? Yeah. 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 Given where we're at at the time, I, I really engage with what you have here, mm -hmm. and I think it's a great transition. Uh, with the item on the agenda, which is uh, community engagement, mm -hmm. which is going to have a right action website. And what you're suggesting uh, very much, I think, is timely. And we get an update on the uh, climate action plan for the city. How do we build this in structurally? To our climate action plan, and in terms of citizen adoption, that might be part of the right action. So I think you're leaving a great foundation to move forward in a really beautiful way. So Perfect. I'm glad you're here. Compliment. Very helpful, Chairs. Thank you. Thank you. It's good. That's great. So that um, presentation be available. I think yeah. Was, I was, I'd love just the, the graphics alone. Yeah, and also if it's helpful at your at your school, I'm happy to come yeah. and chat. If you could send it to to Kate and Kate could send it out to the whole committee is very very yeah. useful. I can give you the PowerPoint with the notes in it if people want to talk over. Awesome. Um, next you. up, yeah. the engagement committee update. Is that... Yes. Yes. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Loud and clear. Okay. Um, the community engagement subcommittee has been very busy. We're working on a whole bunch of different pieces and things, getting bright action going, some content for websites, an email, some different events. But I think the one that's most important that I update all of you on um, is our Earth Day kickoff event that we are planning. It is one of the three dates that we have on the Portsmouth 400 calendar. It's April 21st, so that is the day before Earth Day, which is a Friday. We are hoping to do it like an afternoon kind of evening thing, roughly from four to seven. We are collaborating with the library. They are very excited to help us with this event. So we don't exactly have a set time just because we don't know if it'll be in the field next to the library right now or the library seeing if the Connie Bean might be an option or maybe within the library itself. So just depending on what that turns out to be, we just haven't set the date. That said, the intention of the event is really to educate and inform as many people as we can about a few different things. Um, first, how they can get involved and what they can do. So we really wanna see Earth Day as an actual day of action. So our hope is that if we can gather enough organizations and community groups and different people at this event to share about what they do, whether it's beach cleanups or, um, I, you know, I don't know, there's a myriad of things, but, to give people ideas of what they can commit to doing on Earth Day. And that could be they, they sign up for a beach cleanup or they commit to having a compost or they start riding their bicycle more or they donate to one of these organizations, whatever resonates for them. Um, some of the people that we hope to invite um, are this city. We're hoping somebody from this committee and or the sustainability and planning department can be there. Our hope and Kate and Peter, I will defer to you, is that maybe we'll have a, con a contract with the consultant. So maybe somebody from that consultant company could be there as well and 
just sort of see how we're doing things. We can start to get feedback from people about what their priorities are around the cap and what's important to them and for as a way to start to educate people about the cap. Um, potentially have DPW there, Brian, to share and talk about more about what you guys do with water, <laughs> those kinds of things. Um, we're hoping to have the Eco Club there, Ben, Lorelai, and Eco <laughs> Students for Sustainability. Um, uh, the C Ray and a lot of the gr the groups that fall under that now, so TCAG and Portsmouth Climate Action and Rad and Planted for the Planet. And then also just other local organizations like the Gundalo that does a lot of conservation work on the river, the Blue Ocean Society, CELT, uh, the Urban Forestry Center, the Seacoast Science Center, Seacoast Eat Local, Surf Rider. I have like a list of uh, 15 to 20 groups that we're hoping to send out emails to see who would be interested in participating. We hope to make it a really family friendly event as well to have activities and ways for people to engage. We're working on the potential for food and music as a way to entice people there as well. Um, and I think that's really most of the key points. Like I said, there's some other things going on, but that is where our efforts are really focused at this point. We've met with the library once and kind of designated tasks. We're going to meet with the library again in two weeks to kind of follow up and see where we're at and how progress is being made. Um, we're going to start reaching out to see who's available to participate and engage with us on this event. The end. Awesome. Um, Margo had a note about Is there questions for Questions for Jess? Or? Yeah, this was related to oh, oh okay. Like that. This is just an update from Margo about the school stuff, but I don't know if you're all set, Jess and Effie, on. It, 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 Jess, I'd like to piggyback on thank you for and for all the great work you're doing with uh, coordinating on Earth Day and uh, the kickoff and, and Earth Day, because we're looking at events on, on both of those days. Uh, and two other things I, I wanted to mention. Uh, one is uh, the voice of citizens. So from an engagement and community engagement perspective, Jess, Effie, and I have talked about you know, do we survey uh, members of the, of the community? You know, how do we understand what is, we can sit here all day long and tell the community what we think they want or what they should hear, but we really need, it's gotta be two ways. So we really need to, to identify what those methods are that we're going to um, re receive you know, the thoughts of the community, what's the voice of the community. Uh, we had last fall talked about waiting until the contractor for the cap had come on board because what we don't want to do is have too much, you know, bombard the community. We want to do that in a very effective, efficient way and very targeted. And who better to help guide us on how we should do that than the new contractor? So that's something that we're looking forward to and very excited about as they come on board is because that's going to be important for them. It's important for, for the city. It's important for all of us is to really gauge and, and listen to the community. So that's one thing I wanted to mention, uh, Jess and Effie. And the other thing I wanted to say to everybody too, and, and Jess, I apologize if this is too early, but Jess has been talking to the farmer's market and she's also been talking to the library about periodically getting a booth or a table set up and so whether it's people from this committee or from Portsmouth Climate uh, Action, which is you know, part of the Sea right, uh, setting up a table or a booth once a month, every two weeks, and getting a volunteer so we can get people to sign up for, first of all, bright action. But then we're also there to engage with the community and hear what they have to say and, and bring them up to speed on what we're doing. So I think that is going to be what Jess is, is kind of outlined for us. There's two venues right there for us to continuously engage with the community on a face-to-face -face level, which is really exciting. 
So Jess, I didn't mean to steal some of your thunder, but there's so many great things I know that you're working on, we're working on, and I just wanted to make sure people were aware of some of these, you know, additional things that are are in the pipeline. If there's more questions for those guys, other people, but I, I, if I could, I'd like to give an update on how it actually plans. It ties in nicely with, with all this. Um, but, anybody but, else? I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious when the invitations are going to go out to um, these organizations. And the reason I'm asking is, is that I would think the sooner the better, because then they could send to their lists mm -hmm. of people, which would yeah. generate more interest. I guess you want to talk about the timing and looping back with the library, because we do have to, before we move forward, we have to secure you know, the facilities and, and get that all locked in. Um, yep. So to answer your question, Kate, I, I agree with you. And now I will say I have connections at some of these organizations already. So I've sort of planted the seed a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I'm obviously away right now, but my hope is that if I can steal a few minutes this weekend and definitely next week, I will start sending out emails. I have um, Karen Barndollar has also offered to help us with this effort because she knows some people at some of these organizations and to reach out as well. And just even though we don't have all the specifics kind of say, hey, can you put this on your calendar? Would you be interested in participating? My goal is that um, we meet with the library again on February 6th. And my hope is that I will have some sort of answer from most of the organizations about you know, yes, maybe no by that time. Um, because like you said, I know people are starting to plan for Earth Day. And my, the other thing that I think we thought about was that twofold, this might be a day that is more easy to do because a lot of people will have, or a lot of organizations will have events on Earth Day itself. Um, and so we're really excited to have this as a kickoff to encourage action on Earth Day. So I'm hoping that might help make some groups more available as well, because they won't necessarily be committed on the day before Earth Day, as they might, you know, more likely might be on Earth Day. Is that what day? What day is it? A, is it going to be on a weekend day or is Earth Day going to be on a weekend day? Earth Day is a Saturday. April 27th is. is Saturday this year. Yep. So we would do this Friday afternoon, Friday evening on the 21st. I have two first day connection update, if that's okay. Um, so Margo, thanks for reminding me. Margo emailed me. She couldn't make tonight, but she had an update for all of us. And Ben, you might know more about this, but the school department apparently passed a no homework weekend for the entire school district. <laughs> On Earth Day. No, oh, I did not know about that. No. Oh, sorry, that was probably a surprise. Been passing down here. News for me, though. Okay. And I guess there's going to be a day of crime action as well. And so the schools will all be organizing groups to participate in a day of crime action. And that's going to happen in the next month or two. And also the PHS bike rack has been approved. Oh, oh no, news, right? Yeah. Awesome. Thank um, you. I have just have a quick note on some of the things that we were saying about. Uh, like tabling, and I think I would just like to make sure that we're really reaching out to different parts of the community as well. Um, you know, I think like maybe a lot of the people who would be at library farmers market are one subset of our community, but there's a lot of subsets. I think looking at things like are these events on the weekends? Like it's if it's people who work on the weekends for. Yeah, so just making sure that as we're doing this outreach, especially as we're getting survey, which is part of what the consultant is responsible for, but that we're getting a broad sense from the community um, and that we're making sure that we're giving avenues for everyone. Yeah, that's a great point. And, we, and we, last fall, we came up with a laundry list of different, like, the the senior center mm -hmm. and you know we came effie i think had just a whole list of you know we could go to here and we could go here we could get here and one thing that we stopped for and our, our enthusiasm i think was getting away a little bit and we said oh wait a second we're all volunteers <laughs> and we all, you know we all have jobs and we're like okay so let's let's get together with the consultant you know when they come in and let's let's figure out where we get the most bang for our buck. 
because at the end of the day, you know, there's only there's only so many hours in the week. And so it would be great. I mean, we'd love to do do it all, but we, you know, we're gonna have to cherry pick. Yeah. Well, and I guess that's the uh, right. It, rather than maybe doing three tabling events at the farmer's market, maybe it's one at the farmer's market and putting our eggs yeah. in the basket somewhere else as well and making yeah. sure that it's more widespread rather than one exact exactly. setting. Because often it is similar <laughs> parts of the community that are going to be or the same people yeah, yeah. <laughs> right you got the same audience yeah yeah and there might be partnership opportunities like you might be able to get Prescott Park Arts Festival mm -hmm. to let you sit at their table one night that's within the festival grounds yeah to share information yeah. and yeah. you know it's those places where there are a lot of people in the summer or the concerts yeah right yeah yes um I I agree with you. I I would add, like Herb said, we've come up with a laundry list of things and some of the other places that are on that list that we, um, again, yeah. sort of tabled for the time being where I know like a lot of our affordable income housing, they have community centers and those kinds of things. So seeing if we could get access to them, maybe at a time when, you know, <laughs> parents are picking up kids from after school or something like that, trying to see if that might be something, trying to work with the Portsmouth Housing Authority to see if that was a possibility in some way too. So I just I just wanted to throw that out there. It was something we've discussed. We haven't figured out the details, but it was something we thought about. That's great. And I think that's a great segue to Peter and the cap because a lot of this will come back on consultant and what yeah, I guess right, um, I saw when you were talking tabling, you mentioned a lot of um I guess that's just look at you. <laughs> I, I saw you mention a lot of uh nonprofit groups. You're looking at um like companies that do environmental work as well, like in like revision energy or eco sound builders, or there's a number of companies and you could maybe posit it as like this isn't like a sales opportunity, but more an educational opportunity. Like you can talk about what you do and why it's important, not necessarily a pitch, but just like, hey, we're a builder and we build buildings in this way because it's an environmental thing and, and it's an educational thing. Jess, do you want me to take take a crack at that? Uh well, sh feel free to add on, but I do want to say, um, Aubrey, we had discussed that actually, um, not so much in the builder perspective. So I'm glad you brought it up because it was something I meant to mention. We had thought about it in regards to like Mr. Fox, um, to have them there, you know, and just to your point, if it's a library at the library, so it's sort of a city event, we don't want to show preferential treatment to any one business over another, but I do think there's value there. We had also thought about like some of the upcycle clothing stores in town that could come and just talk about fast fashion, not necessarily promoting their business. Um, so personally I am definitely open to that I just don't know how you kind of create the guidelines to make it clear that we're we're not showing preference to one company over another and like you said it's more of just come and educate people about better ways of doing things or more sustainable ways of doing things so I'd be open yeah. to feedback and other people's perspective I mean that's the, that's the struggle I mean we could invite Portsmouth Ford Right, because they sell electric vehicles and say, well, don't push Portsmouth forward, just push the concept of electric vehicles. I think I, others, I'm sure, have different opinions, but uh, if we get away from the non, just the pure nonprofit community, city uh, groups and start getting into uh, groups that are there for profit, it's, it, 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 it's tough. Who, I mean, who do you invite, right? And and, it, and the city of Portsmouth is tied to all of this. So there's a city of Portsmouth taking preference for a revision over another solar electric company. Yeah. I think it's a, you have to be careful. It, it's one thing if you hold an event and you let vendors choose to sign up and pay a fee to be there versus right. asking them to come, yeah. I think. Yeah, so maybe it's you know the nonprofits or who are getting reached out to, right? We would like you here, but maybe there is a space, and maybe there's a to kind of keep the feel 
more community engagement. Maybe it's, you know, you're setting up 20, 25 tables for nonprofits and community-based, and there's five or 10 tables for profit-based, and it's, a, you know, if they reach out, um, it's not the other way. But yeah, I, at, at some point, though, you know, we have I mean, all the things that Jess listed sound like really amazing no. to have there. So, has there been any discussion of uh, corporate sponsorships? Speaking of the forefront, or the twenty first for that day, and yeah. the twenty second. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, Jess, uh, we have no. May or may not need funds, but yeah, I guess what what is the money needed for? I don't know. No, that that discussion has not come up. I mean, again, most of the organizations that we were working with, it was more, um, you know, their nonprofit. It's an opportunity for them to share, for people to engage and get involved. Um, even the foods that we're working with, we're trying to kind of figure out a way to make that sustainable and free. And so I don't know if there's a lot of costs there needed so we haven't discussed um and and the library has talked about budgeting for whatever expenses we may have so all right in the library i think also you know they're helping guide us on um what we can and can't do on city property right <laughs> so, um you know because we could do some pretty wild things probably um but <laughs> You know that's something that they're I, Jess. I, I believe right there. You know they they've they've uh, communicated to you that that's something they're going to help guide us through. You know what we can and can't do, uh, yes. which is is yeah. really important. Mm -hmm. uh, who at the library? Before? Yeah, I just wanted to mention that Laura Horwood Benton, who I believe is the assistant director at the library was one of the authors of the city of Portsmouth's report on community engagement. So they're really into this whole idea and really supportive of our work. And, and Jess, Peter, uh, Peter Britz was asking who you had just recently met with and are working with at the library. I, I met with their um, new communication, I forget what her title is, Christy Bryant. And Sarah Cornell and um, Michaela, and I can't remember Michaela's last name. I'm not even sure I could pronounce it. It's like P U G something or other. Um, yeah. And, and to sort of reiterate what Effie said, um, Christy is very excited and very committed to wanting to be as much a part of this as she can on behalf of the library. Sustainability is a really a big focus for her. She's hoping to have a lot of events about this throughout the year. Um, so they are they are fully engaged. They're very excited. They like the idea of this event that it's sort of the kickoff to get people to take action. We've talked about maybe coming around full circle and doing a movie or something later on the day at Earth Day so people could kind of gather and talk about whatever action they took and maybe watch just a fun uplifting movie about sustainability and so they are fully committed and engaged. One additional idea for getting corporates involved is they always want to talk about what they're doing for impact work, uh, envir environmental, social. There could be some sort of a, an entry where everyone gets, all the corporates get a table, they have to buy their way in, and then they share to the community what they're doing in the community, and then the community votes on which one they think is doing the most impact. <laughs> and then whoever wins gets the prize. But that's a way to get community involved. It's a way that companies get to talk about what they're doing. It's a way to get people to come to their tables and hear what they're doing, but in a way that's not like, they're not going, they're trying to sell their products. I mean, they're trying to sell what they're doing for impact. But just to, just an idea. Yeah. And, 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 and I just want to say <laughs> one more thing, because I'm kind of, I think Jess and I differ a little bit in that I don't want, I don't think that court, uh, com for profit companies, we should invite them. And one of the reasons really that's driving that is that this is a kickoff 
And what we're trying to do is we're, we're trying to educate the community on some, an activity that they can do on Saturday. And so if we invite, invite revision, is revision, are they bolstering uh, the messaging that is revision going to help people identify things that, right? Or is Mr. Fox going to help them identify versus some of the nonprofits are really looking for people to, and they want to educate them, but also like uh, Blue Ocean Society and others have events going on on Saturday. Mm. And so on Friday, they want to be able to educate. Yeah, an awareness of Awareness yeah. to say, come out tomorrow morning mm -hmm. and help us do X or the Urban Forestry Center or others that are running events on Saturday. And this is really kind of an awareness and a recruiting event versus us educating uh, on, you know, our solar panels on your house or something like that, which I'm sure we'll be doing in the future, yeah. right? I mean, those events are given. But this those, this that keeps the focus on the day. This is really focused on Earth Day and not so much the greater uh, climate action and sustainability efforts and all that we're driving through the cap. And so with saying the cap, I think that's <laughs> a good yeah. topic, right? Yeah, um, I, I just, uh, before we move to the cap, I just wanted to say, um, we also have the date October 22 in the Portsmouth 400 calendar. And um, some groups are referring to that as sustainability day. Uh, some people were calling it half Earth Day, but that didn't make much sense, but it's uh, six months after Earth Day. So it's a good time to check in and make sure that this work is happening. So people can put it in the minutes and in your calendars. Thanks. Great. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, we'll do Peter real quick with CAP Outreach and Engagement, but we do also need to get to Bill and TX40. Again. Okay. But yeah, I think I won't take too long. Um, so it's great to hear about all this volunteer work. And obviously, there's attention you to everything as volunteers. and. And similarly, we can't do everything with our contractors because there's only so much money. So the thought I had was, what can we do working together? And the, the way I want to talk about it is that the, so the contract has been signed by the contractor. It's in the city now circulating um, the legal department and finance to make sure everything's correct. And then we'll sign it. So it'll be signed in a few days. Um, and so three big things that are happening in the contract are, are three big uh, workshops that the contractors you know, set up to do. And we've talked to them about outreach in the community and not just having your traditional workshop in the library kind of thing, but not knowing what all those other outreach opportunities are. And that's how they've structured it. So we've, we've talked to them about um, seeing what kind of response we get from the outreach they plan. And it's not just those workshops, but the three workshops are gonna be basically introducing you know, climate action and what people can do and what it means. The second one will be more taking in input, getting gathering uh, support and uh, preferences from the community on what they want to see. And then the third is kind of the overall conclusion of where we're going and, and what the cap's going to look like, maybe even the, the, the cap itself being presented. Um, so if you think about it in those three sort of terms, the contractor is going to have a lot of work cut out for them to do all the work with those. But what I was thinking was, this group, Portsmouth Climate Action, other groups in the community could be um, at the same time taking out the, the sort of the slide deck or the message that that contractor puts together and bringing it out to different presentations at different places in the community. So what I want to try to do is see who we can get to assess, help with that, who has interest in assisting with that, um, whether it's a group or a person or an organization. Um, just to try to broaden our reach because just having the contractor go out, they're not going to reach everyone. How do we reach everyone in each of these phases and still think about it in these three phases that we're going to try to do so that we follow along the work of the cap. We still are able to get the cap done in the time frame we want to get it done in with is less than a year. Um, but it really could strengthen and energize. And I think events like this are perfect for bringing messages out where we are in the process. Um, setting up our own events as well, and then, um, you know, taking it on the road, if you will, to different places. And different people. So that's kind of how we're thinking about it right now. 
Um, once we sit down with the contractor and we'll get more, you know, to initial, we haven't even done an initial meeting with them. We've had our proposal meetings, but we haven't had them with the contract in hand to start the, to start the work of what we're actually doing. But that's really what I'm looking at. And so I'm really excited to hear there's a lot of energy from and a, and a plan really going forward for a community group because to have that synergy is going to be really helpful for the city and the community kind of working together towards a common goal. Um, and then we just have to map out how that's all going to work. But I see that you know, it's a lot easier knowing there's a segment of the community that's working on, on this effort already. Um, and then we'll just put some structure to it from the climate action plan side and see what we have to do. I think that's the big, the big piece I wanted to say. Yeah. Can you repeat the three, three phases of phases? So three, they, they describe it in their contract as three different workshops. And the first one is really introduction and uh, engagement piece where we bring people together and talk about what a climate action plan is and what they're trying to achieve and get a little bit of input. Those ideas of surveys might come a little bit at that point, but mainly the second workshop will be where there'll be a lot more gathering information, bringing people in and getting their preferences for what types of uh, greenhouse gases gas emission reductions, the targets people want to see, what the tolerance is in the community for that, what looks like people want to set as targets, that kind of thing. And then the third one is kind of a presentation back to the community on what they've heard, what they found, fine-tuning things that they heard from the community. Um, and so those are the three, and at each one there'll be presentations. And what I'm going to talk to them about is making those presentations broader than just those meetings, but other outreach along those those segments. So at three different phases of the work sort of through the climate action. Let me feed back to my group. They want to introduce in a workshop and invite the community to hear what is a climate action. That present what present what it is for us. You know, we've been working on it for a couple of years now and when we started it in the life. So this would be an initial a climate action plan is this and this is what it tries to then next point is get information from the community. That information would be what already exists, all these different organizations, this committee, other committees, uh, what's happening in the community. Am I right about more than that? I think they want to get the, they want to get a take on the community, what the community wants. What do they want to see in a climate action plan? What do they want to set for targets? What are they willing to do? Like, Get more feedback. It'll probably be more the back and forth input into the contract. So, uh, getting that information, that's going to be an important design. And I'm assuming they have some pretty good experience in bringing community together and getting input, interactive groups, and dialogue. Is that they, they do? But what I'm saying is, we want to broaden that beyond what they can do. What can we do with that? So having them set it up, but then design it in a way that they can give it to people that will take it beyond them. So it'll be, you know, take it in that phase and it'll work. What can other people pick up? So what could someone present to a school to a school group? Or what could someone present to their their organization they work with? Right? A replicable workshop. Yeah. That yeah. Be... That's what I'm thinking. That's what I want to talk about. Well, because I'm thinking when we had the West Stand. And the planning department had a kind of dialogue, and everybody wanted to decide like a charrette. Charrette. That was very interactive. It got the community that was existing there and stated what they wanted. Then they came out with a vision. Right. And so I think of that as one effort that a contractor set up and ran, but that effort had certain goals and components to it. That effort would be able to be replicated by community members or others that are interested on a different state, different scales, but so that we're getting that input from different places. We're, trying, we're going to try to get the equity piece and reach the rest of the community. It's not just going to be come to our public meeting and give your input. That's what I want to push them. How do we broaden this beyond you know, just these three meetings? So we have a history of course with this and that went for many years trying to get this in an interactive fashion. So we already have that as part of our cultural history. Is that kind of enforcement? This is what's still active right now. 
we can say we can combine with them to replicate the content and use that as a dialogue yeah, for this. Or the listeners could run at each phase of this workshop, or the listeners could run a, a segment that is maybe it's first looks like it could be multiple things, so it could be a couple of things in the first one, a couple of things in the second, a couple in the third, or there's three, however you know. But that's the kind of thing that we have to flesh out. And before we flesh that out, we have to figure out what the contract is. God, right and then at the same time, tell them we want more than what you're doing. We want to build on that with our community and bring as much energy as we can. Because culturally, what I see we want to do is we want to get a community that has cultural archetypes of interaction between government, the private sector, business and organizations. That's a huge system. So that's where, as it's designed, that's kind of what I'm seeing. We have a really unique community here and some of those things already being established. COVID kind of put it on the back burner. As we come into a new phase with the climate action plan, I think we want to do, from my perspective, a renaissance of community interaction. And I mean, so that's, I think where we're going, but I just want to articulate that, if that makes sense. Um, to that end, might there be a benefit of us trying to collaborate with the, with the citywide neighborhood committee? For sure. And that one, of the that I was, that one of the groups that I was thinking that someone maybe go present to, or that they have someone work with the contractor to have, you know, that's part of that, that's in their plan too, but. Yeah. yeah, I think it would be important. That's exactly what I was going to say. Um, even if the citywide neighborhood committee isn't doing it, the people there are, who are all part of their neighborhood organizations. Yeah, yeah where yes. there's an established network, it certainly want to go. To that's network. kind of young that together. Yeah. Um, I was also wondering, um, since this all got launched through efforts of this committee, would it be possible to get these contractors to come to one of our meetings yeah. soon and just give us a quick presentation on... Uh, yeah, what what I want to make it. I want to make it efficient, and in our in the you know not taking the budget in a, in a tangent. So yeah, that's sure. Perfect. But I just got to got to figure out how that is. But I would like it to be getting them this input. Maybe people can think about where they can bring people into the process as community people. Give it back. So this is you know um, when they come, I think we want to have them do something, make them work a little bit while they're here <laughs> instead of just presenting. And so we're trying to figure out what that work is, but yeah, totally. I mean, that's what I'm talking about. It's presenting. It's it kosher to get or to distribute the proposal or the their, their proposal? Yeah, for sure. You know, like because yeah. I know we know we told us who it is, but maybe that would be really helpful for us. Like, okay, well, the contract is, you know, would be better, though. Yeah, whatever material the they would be used to draft the contract, and they had. Scope lined out, yeah. and we try to scope in the phases of the contract. So it's pretty similar, but yeah. Um, yeah. I'm thinking like contract, but then I know with a lot of proposals, you know, there's a lot of selling yourself. Yeah. <laughs> That's no. helpful to know, you know, like, okay, this yeah. is the personality yeah. of this That's consultant. So I think maybe that that's a question for us to get a feel for it. Or yeah, yeah is that on uh i know it's public record but is it no, it's not anywhere now but well it's on uh okay you, know, you, you email us all a copy yeah. of that oh, really? yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. of the contractor's proposal you sent it to the group yeah you got the proposal um peter what's the yeah peter what's the expected time frame for the contract going through the city departments uh, it shouldn't take too long. I'm hoping. I I I thought it'd be the whole thing would be done right now, but uh, it should be done by the end of this week. This next week. But it's it's uh it's just this morning started its way around the city, so it usually doesn't take too long. If I don't hear, hear anything back by the end of next week, I'll be pestering. But it shouldn't. Be. Are we passing along all the report backs also that we've received already? Like from the TCAD, from green buildings, from you know all these subcommittees and all the work that's already been done to the consultant. Okay. Not yet. 
that was the, you know, okay. the heavily engaged thing. So, <laughs> I just would hate for them to no come to present, yeah, yeah, to present to us and not realize the volume of work that's already yeah. been done. Yeah. Just clarification. So uh, that proposal was mailed out. I'm seeing it by email December 16th, and I am, I'm seeing it. So if anyone wants to go back and check, our email completed on December 16th. Maybe one of the other comments from the chat. Okay. Always a uh, lucky break to be at the end of the day when everyone. <laughs> 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 that top one, yes, that's short. Your summary and one of the pleasures of coming to this meeting at our TK group has met for about five months quickly. This is the first time I've ever actually seen this guy after Zoom calls every weekend. And uh, Ken is the last of the TCAG members to come to the sustainable practices community. So he met the other other members in November, uh, November and December. And um uh, Kate has sent out our topic briefings. You may remember we had five five topics and strategies. And in December, we did a short version of it. Uh, next next slide, please. And our our vision very much focused on the CAP: develop climate friendly transportation solutions as input for the CAP. Uh, next slide. And I think what uh, considering the time available, I think that what we'll do. Now is just a real quick refresh, and I think maybe second or third to food, probably transportation is something people love to talk about. And when we presented these ideas earlier, we didn't have a lot of time, but we, uh, I guess at the November meeting, had a lot of discussion on these, uh, these topics. We didn't have a lot of time to go into it. Then uh, we don't have a lot of time to go into them in detail now and i think what we might do is just ask uh i think hopefully some of you have had a chance to look at the the longer version of that we've got uh two to three pages briefing pieces on each of these uh, five topics and um each of those has portsmouth context uh it has best practices drawn from a peer communities caps as well as uh related planning activities for some really innovative transportation activities that can reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And then we had a, um, a set of strategies that might be five to 10 for each of the five topics. And uh, you'll, you'll see that really the core, the core topics, and these are universals, I think could safely say if you go to every uh, best practice cap, and I think we've seen the inventory that, that uh, Effie and Herb and I think uh, Jess and others put together of CAPS, uh, you'll, you'll see those bottom three. You'll see the shared mobility, which is public transit. You'll see bike and pedestrian, and you'll see alternative fuels and electric vehicles. Those are really foundational. And we were very excited to add the land use, alignment of land use and development with transportation current and future. And that, that was uh, the one that uh, Ken Ferrer uh, led and I think is really an interesting one and I think it's just really key to getting people to do the two things that it takes to reduce transportation greenhouse gases in in Portsmouth and and everywhere around the world and that's a mode shift shift to sustainable modes green modes uh, away from personal fossil fuel burning cars and other vehicles and shifting to um, alternative fuels, especially EVs, those, those, those two things. And the EV, the bike pad, and the shared mobility public transit are, are really core. I think the land use is really foundational. And then the community engagement is transportation, community engagement, important part of that. And hopefully that'll be an important part of the CAP community engagement. And you, you'll see really what we were focusing on each of, the, in each of those the land use to reduce travel distance between home and work. So that that's a really complex but very critical item. EVs, um, really building out uh, the charging infrastructure, the bike pad and the shared mobility really shifting out of personal vehicles. And that ties in very nicely with uh, some of the things that Chaz was talking about um, earlier 
moving away or or the that Kate mentioned uh let's say in uh condos and apartments having shared vehicles rather than the personal vehicles taking up space and sitting idly for uh, 23 out of 24 hours a day and a day or two out of the week for many of you uh next slide uh we we presented a a favorite priority strategy for each of those five uh, the shared mobility and public transit, this is something that would complement uh, existing coast and uh, wildcat service, which is really underused and I think obscenely underfunded. Uh, if you look at some of the information that's on the New Hampshire DOT website put together by the, the National uh, Planning Commission, you see how little money is available in uh, New Hampshire uh, communities and, and statewide. It's, it's a miracle that coast puts out what they're able to do. So we were thinking of something that would uh, fill a, a, a niche that would be really uh, innovative, a shuttle loop that would allow people to get uh, between key destinations in Portsmouth. A, a lot of trips that you take now on coast, and that's one of the reasons people don't take it, is that at best it runs hourly. And if you want to get from one key location to another, you actually have to come into the center and transfer to go out in many cases. So this would be something, and in each of our topics, we looked at best practices, this best practice uh, suggestion is modeled on Savannah, Charleston, and Burlington, which has a public-private partnership where the city partners um, often with the hospitality uh, industry and developers to run a free circular shuttle. Uh, in the case of Portsmouth, it, it could be an EV shuttle. It could have a flexible or uh, fixed schedule. It could be a traditional bus, but it's uh, I think our one big idea on this, and I, I think if certainly if there was something like that available where you could know exactly when you could get on it to go to, to Pease or down Route 1 or uh, out, out to Newington, that's just a continuous circle um, that could complement what's there. For the bike pedestrian, we have a, a, an excellent uh, city bike pedestrian plan, uh, and our idea for that is to um, update it and then to use that to uh, complete gaps and identify priority corridors. And that really is something that's underway. But I think the big change here is we're now talking about the cap. So it isn't just doing good bike ped projects or running uh, a nice, hopefully well-used new uh, public transit shuttle, but having this then become key parts of uh, a future greenhouse gas reduction target for the city of Portsmouth. Um, the, we'll just, just stop on those two. I mean, the land use transportation we could talk about for a, really a full meeting, and maybe we can do that some other time when we can and get Ken here. Um, the 15 minute city is something that we really like. Um, there are parts of Portsmouth that are virtually 15 minute cities. So the question is how to make those uh, stronger and how to identify future ones around combined land use and transportation plans and projects. And I, I think that all stop there there really isn't enough time and everyone's too tired to get into this <laughs> individually what i would say is if you haven't looked at our briefing document that kate, kate sent out uh uh it would be great if you gave it another look and maybe we'll have a chance to get into those in more detail another time maybe a a, a subgroup of really interested people to really dig into that maybe we can do that with with the cap consultant with stakeholders. I mean, it's really pretty open-ended. And I think what we did was lay out ideas and frame these things. And what uh, what I think I'd like to do in the next few minutes is just considering what Peter said about the cap and other discussion on the community engagement, talk a bit about how we can build on what we've done. Lorelai. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask if you could explain what a 15 minute city is. Uh, 15 minute city is, I believe, I forget the, the French person, that, um, uh, transportation professional that came up with this concept. But um, um, in essence, what you're trying to do with land use and transportation, it's actually a very like systematic approach of trying to get people to mode shift. And the way to do that best is to have services, homes, retail, everything in a kind of radius that is either walkable or achievable through transit 
uh, or other modes in less than 50 minutes. Um, so you can, you know, you can go to the bank, you can go to uh, your house to school, and then come back, and it's it's a very comfortable trip to do outside of the park. Yeah. So to meet as many of your needs and to take as many as your trips as possible, it probably wouldn't be a hundred percent, but as yeah. many as possible, and to very conscious design uh, the future developments and align that with. Uh, uh, bike bike paths, sidewalks, and accessible transit, so you can get as much done as possible within 15 minutes. Um, Same and, as from a yeah. from a government perspective, looking at when you're going to build a facility, it's like, oh, well, how close it is to a, a population center or a, or a, or where a lot of people live. Uh, if you're going to build some school or some like service and it's out nowhere, but in the middle of nowhere, there's no no land uh, or it's like a cheaper land, then is that good? <laughs> Port, Portsmouth is small, 20,000 yeah. population, but it's compact. Mm -hmm. it, it has some great opportunities for that that you wouldn't find yes. in other communities. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if you're interested in the concept, that I think it's 20 minute city for Paris, but mm -hmm. their mayor and city leadership have really really stress that and back that up with mm -hmm. investments in uh, bike, pedestrian, and transit facilities. And mm -hmm. that is a priority versus building new new roads and uh, new expressways. Um, maybe if there are any quick comments on this package of topics uh, or reactions, and then like to think a little bit about uh, next, next steps, how uh, TK can support the cap. For being a first grade teacher, I love you keep bringing this slide up because every time I see it, oh, that's what he's talking about. So thank you, keep coming back. And you, you've, said, you've said that before and I appreciate it very much. Well, it's true, it's true. I think now I look at it and it, it's just like, we were not familiar with what a climate action plan. Now it's part of the culture. I think what you're doing is helping make the transportation and words like co-benefits and that kind of keeps coming in and it starts to create a common culture that brings us all together. So I appreciate and that. That common culture is very much part of the transportation community engagement because people uh, to follow any of these strategies need to change behavior and behavior is very locked in and that it's really got to be part of uh, outreach, uh, education, and incentives, and I think that has to be, if transportation, which is the dominant greenhouse gas uh, emitter, 30% or so on average, if if that's part of the source of Portsmouth's greenhouse gases, it's got to be part of the solution, and that's, uh, it's a tricky business, and I, I think we approach our five topics as closely related. All these things are connected. They're not done in isolation. If they're done in isolation, they fail. Mm -hmm. Effie, did you have a, I thought I saw your hand up a sec, no? Okay. Um, no, I, I'm sorry, you probably saw me thinking. <laughs> and, and what, I, <laughs> what I was thinking about is what uh, Peter mentioned about the contractor getting preferences from the community. And I'm thinking, well, if we say that transportation is a major chunk of the greenhouse gases. So you all in the community should be thinking of that and putting that as a priority. I, mean, I, I don't really know how that happens with community engagement. And I'm not saying I have the answer, but that's what I was thinking about. And clearly a presentation bill like your group put together leads the way, I think. So I think the, the question is how does that then blend into the community engagement so the community members and stakeholders can look at that and say some of these things make sense, some things don't make sense, uh, we like this, we don't like that, and it becomes part of it so the consultant isn't, isn't starting with a blank page. Mm -hmm. So how to do that is the question. How to do that and when to do that, and I think, Peter, you, you're sort of uh, alluding to that when you said potentially multiple supportive activities around these three workshops mm -hmm. and the timing and this overall strategy, I think this seems key. 
yeah, if your group's willing, then maybe some presentations with the support of the contractor or bidding into the contractor's yeah. work plan. Uh, so as, as, as topic time. openers, not, yeah. not this is a done deal, but mm -hmm. uh, food for thought. Right, food right. For thought. I just want to say thank you for all the work you have been putting in. Mm -hmm. I think the resources that you're creating are incredibly helpful. And I think, especially as we move into this stage of really trying to educate and get information that comes from a Portsmouth perspective to people in the community, things like the resources, like the sheets that you've created, are incredibly helpful for that. Um, I think it's something that people can. Be introduced to, but then go home and read more into and get more involved into kind of in their own time and the way that they want to do, um, rather than you know it's it's a a lot of these things are pretty big concepts to just learn in a presentation and feel like you got it all. So thank you. Th for the th thank you on uh, behalf of the group, and I have to admit that the group I think began more as transportation people and climate people, and I think that. <laughs> It's much easier to talk about transportation than it is to talk about transportation and climate. What it is. So I think we're over five months, I think we've come around as a group to keep focusing on really where's the bank for the buck. Yeah. And then on the other side, there's a couple of things that we've been doing on the green building um, committee that I'd love to make sure that we're plugged in the land use and some of the EV conversations to make sure that the co-benefits that we were talking about and yeah. so many of these things are not individual. Maybe maybe we can have a follow-up meeting um, with you and just focus specifically on that. And then yeah. really that comes under the primarily the land use side. Yeah. But then it's the transportation connections to yeah. it. And, and Ken is really the key resource. And I think whenever we can have these follow-ups, I know I've had really good discussions well with the people on the climate action weekly but with john and john and i'm talking to Chaz on on monday about some of his some of his ideas so it's 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 a really kind of a catalyst hopefully hey thank you thank you thank you all for coming tonight have anything else in the next four minutes <laughs> well we missed to identify, because I'm looking at the chart, so we identify uh, who will be facilitating the next meeting. And uh, I have this for this. I think it's gotten off. John, uh, Tory, John Kennedy was supposed to be tonight, but I think he's created as somebody. So does anybody have any clarity on who's doing what? Margo was going to take the minutes, but she couldn't take it tonight. So. So next month is supposed to be Margo is facilitating and Aubrey as minutes. But we might let us be facilitated recently. Maybe Aubrey should facilitate. Not that you took the minutes. Okay. okay. I'd rather do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you want, I'm not. Yeah. There is there is an updated sheet. I think John switched around. All right. right. So who do so who do you have down for next week? So next in February it should be Margot and Aubrey, and then let's do it. Let's do it by the sheet because she'll she can come in and yeah. Well, so but what if we do Aubrey Margo then? Just flip it. Just right. That's minutes, right? Yeah, that's the twenty third of February. Yep. They must know how to. You'd rather right? Uh, yeah, I'm fine either way. <laughs> Oh boy. So, then we could just do a quick check out if there is time. Yeah, I'm going to check out. Check out. Um, just go by what impression you had tonight when you're taking away from this meeting. There's another historic meeting, breaking records. We had 20 people present. Never had that at a meeting like this. Our culture is changing. The specificity of what's happening is more concrete grounded. And uh, I, and I'm just a little bit in awe. But, uh, um, I'm really excited about the work that these guys are doing with Earth Day um, and the, the peak that I do. The volunteer work that's going on is pretty impressive. And the timing couldn't be better to, to 
bring in with the climate action plan are pretty excited to see how much that's going to be better in data this year. Mm -hmm. I should say the same thing. Uh, well, I'm just kind of like, oh, what you guys are doing. Uh, and I uh, thank you for like inviting us in as well. Yeah. Uh, I'll say the same thing I said last night at the Portsmouth, the Portsmouth Climate Action Group about community action and uh, all the great stuff that's going on in the energy. And I particularly enjoyed uh, Chess's presentation and started thinking of the differences between leasing something and a trip oriented mm -hmm. service where you, you don't have a car, you don't have a bike, you don't have a motor scooter, uh, but you have access to something that's shared per trip. And I'm having coffee with him on Monday and I'll bring up that point. Uh, Herb, I'm just excited by, energized by the enthusiasm. Uh, this group, and then also there's the Portsmouth Climate Climate Action Group, um, you know, whether it's green building, and I'd like to hear more about what's going on with green building, because when you guys have presented in the past, there's been some really exciting uh, topics there. Uh, but so whether it's that or TCAG, TCAG, every time you guys present, I get excited. <laughs> when I first heard about TCAG, I thought... We're just a small little town, like from a transportation perspective, how can we really have impacts? And you guys have just completely opened my eyes and blown me away that, you know, even a town like Portsmouth, there's so many opportunities that I didn't realize. So um, it's infectious, the enthusiasm. And as Bert has said, I think it just, every time we get together, it builds it greater and greater. So thank you. So, John, this may sound a little repetitive, but very excited about what's going on with Earth Day. Thank you, Jess. The TK stuff is helping a ton. I agree. Every time you guys speak, I feel like I learn a lot more. And all the work that's going on with the cap and the fact that we're about to execute. It's exciting to see all of this stuff happening, but the synergies that are available now that all these engines are spinning up, I can you see here the turbines going. So, very exciting energy. Uh, my takeaway is homework. Uh, <laughs> no, homework. presentations have been really, really know it's well thought out, and, and there's a lot of great stuff in there. And I'm going to try and familiarize myself as much as possible with here because I think it's, I, I think it's stuff that the, the consultants are going to need to hear yeah. and implement. Transportation being probably the most challenging aspect of the climate action plan. Uh, so. We'd be well served, everyone to sort of familiarize ourselves as much as possible as we would. And thank you for it. When I'm sitting here, I can't help but think that this our new consultant is going to be a little overwhelmed by all the work that's being done already. And they're going to wonder if they can keep up with us. So I think that that's exciting. I'm just inspired by all that's going on and everything I've heard and overwhelmed trying to keep notes. <laughs> but there are speakers, Jess and Bill, and I'll be reaching out. I was commenting to Ben earlier today that I think today is my one year anniversary on this committee. And looking back, I'm just so odd with how much progress has been made thus far. For example, I understand all these acronyms and abbreviations that you've been important. That was fun. Uh, but I'm mostly really excited, especially comparing last year's Earth Day with what this year's is going to be. We had a student led rally uh, last year. Now it's something that's not going to just encompass students, but the whole community. So yeah. yeah. And it's so cool to put you know, something that, you know, a couple students care about into the greater context of our community and how many people are really striving towards this goal. And community makes it, makes this uh, challenge so much more rejuvenating to tackle. So very grateful for y'all here today. Yeah, I heard the word synergy over here. And I like that, that word synergy. And also, I'm over, a little overwhelmed with how many things are happening and, and how many things are connected, I mean, they're all connected, but how many things are um, feeding into each other and building off of each other. And it's just fun to see um, just the procedure of how something like this that we've been, you know, we started talking about. I looked, looked, looked at my LinkedIn. I, I started coming to these 
um, almost two years ago, and none of this was happening. And the word cap to me, I would think of like a water bottle. And uh, there's a lot of things that I just say. Acronyms are us. Yeah, yeah. Well, just, just the acronyms alone have, have been my boy, but it's it's been such an education. So I'm always happy to come and you know, like I'm I'm at the nexus of whatever <laughs> the city is doing for sustainability. None of this was definitely happening, Rita, nine years ago. <laughs> so I'm uh, very excited that next week the contract for the cash should be uh, a done deal. Thank you. Uh, I'll second that. I'm really excited. Cap is coming together and it's going to be on the dotted line, which is awesome. And uh, also very excited about all birthday stuff. So thanks for all the effort for the community engagement group. Second that about all our birthday stuff too, and on the weekend, no homework things. <laughs> hey, that's that's good PR. That's I know. Work. Maybe I shouldn't have said that. I don't know what wanted me to say, but try to be But um, I'm really excited hearing about all the connections with the library that just talking about that's really, really going to be a great asset to have. Um, and just having looked at the contract, Peter, and we've gone over it with Salt. So, there are obviously they don't have the largest budget, and there are so many areas where we're going to need more community engagement than what they are available to give to us. And it's exciting to know that we have that capacity as this group, and that we've made so many connections, and we have so many great platforms that we can reach out to. So I feel really, really excited. It's coming. Awesome. And I will finish this off by saying that I was brought into this whole realm because of the cap, because of John. And of course, I took with him at UNH and he was like, you should come to this meeting. And now here I am <laughs> a year later. <laughs> Way you, more involved. <laughs> now it always goes. Well, and so it's very cool to see it come kind of first full circle. And now we're about to see that product starting. Oh. Uh, we have two more people. I do want to mention that uh, a couple of us had lunch with Larry Leverdian. He'd been on the committee for eight years. And if some of you remember the ornament, he was presented that today. And I think it was a meaningful meeting. So thank you. And I think there are two people to call. Jess, do you want to go? Um, I, yeah, I would also say that I'm really excited to hear that we might actually have a contract signed with the consultant so the cap can really start to come together. So that's really exciting. And I would also say that you make me all hopeful having a three and a four year old who did their first chairlift runs today up here. I worry about how many years of skiing they'll get to do. But um, with all the efforts of all of you, maybe it'll it'll be something that they can do for longer than I than I think right now. <laughs> yeah, I'm just excited about everything going on. I'm down in Rincon, Puerto Rico, and I can't wait to be back in Portsmouth. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks, everybody. <laughs> you sure, Effie? <laughs> yeah, I am. <laughs> awesome. With that, I think we can safely say we have a meeting adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Everybody, everyone. We don't know the date.